Hello everyone, this is our second episode of our as yet unnamed film and media podcast and today we're going to be thinking about uh, some of our, one of our favourite um, media characters which is Alan Partridge. And Alan Partridge was uh, a creation of Armando Iannucci, Steve Coogan uh, and was it uh, Chris Morris, was he involved in that? Well, yeah, but, but I guess so, in, in as much as the Sorry. first incarnation of Alan Partridge appeared on Chris Morris's On The Hour radio show. Yeah. So he his first time it was yeah Chris Morris uh, and it, Armando Iannucci's programs that brought him to life. Um, uh, although there's I was going to talk a bit later about the genesis of the character may have appeared with some another comedy duo. Yeah. Um, oh well, well from yeah. first time to this time, um, we're going to try and have a look at the old, the entire Partridge character, his entire career, uh, and we're joined by um, our guests from our first podcast, Connor. So hello, Connor. Oh yeah. By popular demand. Or should we say, <laughs> aha, knowing me, knowing you. Aha. Um, so, can you tell us why you wanted to talk about Alan Partridge and what is it about Partridge that you. Uh, love? Um, I don't know. Well, I've always, I've always been a fan of the character. Like, well, not always, but just, you know, as long as I could have been, I've been a fan of the character. Um, but it, I was never really deeply into it. And then I, um, I heard that uh, Series 2 of this time was coming out. So I thought I'd go back and rewatch a lot of the other stuff and I've just re- recently yeah. just really got into it uh, yeah. that's interesting because this yeah. time is a uh, Partridge's latest output yeah. isn't it it could just finished last week of the time of recording six part um, a satire of the one show uh, but it's interesting actually how we all be interesting to discuss our entry point into Partridge on it because I I can't quite remember the first time I heard or became aware of Partridge you remember being aware of no me knowing you, but I think it was a bit too young to appreciate it at the time. But I think for me it was really um, the first season of um, this, the Alan Partridge TV show. I am, when I, I, really, I am Alan Partridge, sorry, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because Connie, you said uh, as long as you could do, but you could have been your entire life. Because this is a <laughs> character which has been in my consciousness now for 28 years, I think, 27 years. So where, where was your entry level then? What is, what is your first. Um, I think. I think the the first like full thing I watched was Alpha Papa. Ah, okay, but, the film. But, yeah, but the yeah. film. But yeah, I'd seen like clips from um, I am Alan Partridge before that, and then after um, Alpha Papa, I went back and watched I am Alan Partridge. And, like, okay, yeah. my yeah. my age level is um, yeah. the radio series of Knowing Me, Knowing You. I used to travel when I was a kid. I used to play football for a local team and after training on a Saturday morning I'd go with my parents into the local town just to sort of go to shopping weekly shop whatever and every Saturday morning for a run uh, about half past ten this chat show came on knowing me knowing you and it was such a well observed satire or parody on the kind of talk shows of the time that for the first couple of weeks genuinely we weren't sure whether this was real (laughs) or parody or not because it was so that you know everything about it that the not just partridge's you know character but the the guests they'd absolutely got that kind of middle of the road mundane talk show host guests spot on you know it was only after a few weeks we realized some of the same actors were playing multiple parts yeah. that, that we kind of got it so yeah that and that would have been uh, around I suppose autumn 1993 I think because then the TV series of Knowing Me Knowing You came out the following year and it became I remember my as a kid my dad always talking about how Monty Python was a show that he saw as a kid growing up and would you know him and his friends will wait for an episode to come out and then for the next week they will be quoting it to each other and you know they're all reciting the lines in a way and that partridge became that for me and a, and a friend i mean I th- i'm sure we kind of completely alienated ourselves <laughs> from everyone because we would just speak in our partridge quotes and and it wasn't something that everyone you know it yeah. felt like no one was watching apart from me and, and, and this other friend so that was my entry level 93 94 radio yeah. first and then and then tv wow. So you've been yeah. this since the beginning, almost. Yeah, well, almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And it's someone who's stuck with. Yeah, someone who's you know I've literally grown up with since the age of fourteen, and so it's I'm, I was just absolutely fascinated because like I know we've talked about Star Wars on the last one of these, <laughs> but one of the other kind of common junction points that you know in the time that Matt and I have known each other for the past sort of ten or eleven years, um, is is this Alan Partridge. 
for people who are listening maybe haven't are not familiar for partridge he's quite he's as i said he's been around for close to three decades now hasn't he and it's a character played by Steve Coogan, and what what's interesting, I think, you're talking about like where we are on entry points into it, he's changed quite a lot, hasn't he? Like yeah. the character. So at first, I think we probably like more like he's like a satire, really, of you know that sort of middle of the road BBC presenter, isn't he? Really, we now, how would you say he's changed? I mean, what would you say he is now? Because I, I talking before we started recording the podcast, I was starting to worry because I don't know how to define him so much. And I think that comes from, he's so believable and he's, he, he walks that line so perfectly that many people would ex- think he is actually real or confusing for a real person. I know, my, my, despite the fact that he's been a family favourite for decades now, my mum still hates watching him because she finds, <laughs> it, it was one of those original comedies of cringe, you yeah. know, that uh, I think Ricky Gervais often gets lauded for, but Coogan was doing it yeah. for a long time before. But you're right, it started off as a sort of parody uh, uh, more than anything, m- more than perhaps even satire, it was a parody of yeah. uh, the kind of middle of the road BBC presenters, sports presenters in yeah. particular, but also uh, the kind of uh, the uh, chat show hosts like Alan Titchmarsh or um, Wogan, um, and there was, it was an amalgamation of about eight or ten people, old. Radio One DJs like Dave Lee Travis and mm. Alan Freeman and stuff like that. And it was just a really, really well observed parody of that kind of light entertainment that was ubiquitous in, in an era, you know. And, and he, the, I think the, the reason it was so believable because the Partridge character wasn't only an impression, it kind of, the, the Partridge values that he yeah. kind of had were these right of centre sort of traditionalist view of Britain in an era which is changing and not really liking that change. Yeah. And I think, just to alienate uh, the, the the few listeners that we have here, one of the things that, um, when Matt and I are sometimes questioned on our dislike slash hatred of Will Ferrell and the fact that people cannot understand why it's such a problem is that, I think, for me, the problem with the Will Ferrell is that Anchorman was always picked up as, this is the greatest comic yeah. creator character that Will Ferrell's ever created Ron Burgundy is hilarious and I, and I think I might I'm I know I'm missing the point but I the best satire or parody of a TV new anchor or presenter has been going for decades and, and it's Partridge and you know yeah. it's it, it inhabits a character completely yeah I agree with that you're right and I think part of the appeal and part of what makes him so maybe difficult to define is I, I, I no longer sort of distinguish between Partridge and the people he's, you know, trying to parody. Like, you know, he's, as I said, he's been around for so long that he has got a full fleshed out career, hasn't he? We can sort of chart. So, you know, it's so believable that, I don't know, it's just, yeah, I, go, well, I can't tell where Coogan ends anymore and Partridge begins. Now. I think it's interesting the genesis, or the we were talking about the beginnings of the character. I was going to mention at the very start, the genesis character actually was an idea, well, the comedian Richard Herring, who was in a comedy partnership with a guy called Stuart Lee, who's still sort of highly regarded on the stand-up circuit, is, uh, they were a, a comedy duo who had their own sketch shows on the BBC and Channel 4 in the 90s, and they came up through the comedy ranks with Armando Iannucci, Rebecca Front, a lot of them uh, were at um, Oxford together, I think. But they apparently they came up with the idea for Partridge. This is slightly disputed. They, oh, they, yeah. Richard Herring claims that it was something that they suggested to Armando Iannucci, like a, a parody of a sports reporter. But it, that was all it was. There was no kind of anything else uh, attached to it. Yeah. But it, the um, one of the reasons I was so glad that you brought this up, or to, to do this, is because my thoughts on Partridge have sort of not necessarily evolved, but things have clicked into place recently where I realised that, that, as Matt said, it's much, much more than just that parody character now. Yeah. Like a lot of uh, Armando Iannucci stuff, and particularly Chris Morris, uh, who if you if people aren't aware of Chris Morris, they must go and check out, yeah. created this amazing, this was satire of TV news called The Day to Day in the mid-90s, and then a satire of TV documentaries called Brass Die in 1997. What, what Chris Morris was did was he was always ahead of the time and then what happened was TV would kind of evolve into the things he was satirising and he would kind of call it every time he was so ahead of the time and I think Partridge did that as well because so many of the people he was satirising or parodying then characters sort of emerged became him even Richard Madeley who was around when 
partridge was invented became yeah. more partridge afterwards um, who have we got now? Dan Walker from BBC News. Dan Nancy's Walker, most absolutely. <laughs> Jake Humphreys. Yeah. Yeah. You know these. Um, I think Richard Baker's kind of avoided it a little bit because he's. I think he's kind of partridge aware, isn't he? Yeah. But uh, people have become Alan Partridge over the years. Um, and uh, so, so for you, Connor, what I'm interested in: Do you see him as a parody of other presenters, or do you just see him as a, a comedy character, as maybe like? Ron Burgundy is, or someone that a creation of someone. Um, I'd, I'd say a comedy character. I'd say he he stands on his own to some extent as a um, like a like a fleshed out comedy character. He's more than just like a parody or a pastiche of other people. I'd say yeah. Because yeah. The, yeah. What what really hit home was that someone I thought a few people sent to me. Has anyone seen the video of Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer? I haven't seen the video, but I've seen this going round. It's yeah. incredible, yeah. yeah. And it's it's <laughs> what is now in the lexicon referred to as an accidental partridge, yeah. isn't it? When someone behaves in a certain way or says something in a way that is like almost quotable from Alan Partridge. Yeah. This is a short video of Rishi Sunak with some school kids talking about um, their favourite soft drinks, uh, and inexplicably, he declares, I, "Yeah, I'm a coke addict," <laughs> and then does whatever he and realizes he said it, yeah. and then overcompensates to try and clarify that. But it's awkward and it's difficult, and it's that making something much, much worse. And you know, actually, you know, it actually made me quite sympathetic towards him the way he yeah. fails <laughs> dramatically, and it made me realise that what Alan has become is less a parody, like you said, yeah. and it's actually. This is, if we're going to get academic, I think it's a study of the human condition. I think Alan Partridge is a character who mm. wants to get things right, but yeah. can't because of himself, because of his own makeup, and because the world changes so quickly around him that he can't. And a lot of Coogan's characters and, uh, are about people who are sort of stuck yeah. in their own ways, who want to evolve with the world, but they can't. It's a, the world is too much of a complicated yeah. place. I think that's yeah, That's what. He said the emergence of the accidental partridge, like people in 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 the spotlight and stuff. Like now, I, I seem very conscious about what about what they say and how they present themselves and things like that. And partridge is sort of, I said, he's become so ubiquitous and he's been around for so long, but he's so perfect, brilliantly realised. Is that if that that is like a new layer, isn't it? Where it's like people on TV or people in the public eye now know that they can't act a certain way. Yeah. In yeah. terms of how they express things and how they sort of you know share bits and bits bits and pieces about the life you write so it's it's like a reference point isn't it you're constantly th you know thinking about when you're watching the news or the one show or anything like that I think oh, that's a very veered a bit too far towards Partridge yeah but it's it's, yeah. A, it's a brilliant take on how like yeah the, the, the fact that the language has changed or the fact that people have to uh, uh, have different sensibilities and you know yeah. uh, different understanding of the world and some people get a little yeah. bit left behind by that, even though they know they ought to change. Yeah, yeah. And it would be very easy for Partridge to just every now and to sort of be a, a sort of just a character that's st stuck in his ways. That means that uh, he's just trying to beat or defeat yeah. the kind of new way of thinking, yeah. you know, a, a more tolerant society or a more inclusive society. But he his attempts to try and keep up with that, and it's always uncertain whether it's honest you know because he you know or whether it's purely for material career. gain yeah, yeah, yeah career yeah. to boost his career that's in some doubt but his his attempts to do it always end in sort of failure and uh, yeah. or, or it, you know I always feel like he's, he's just one step behind isn't he and I yeah. think if, if Alan was a real person I think he'd be quite a tragic figure quite sympathetic <laughs> like like psychologically he'd, he'd be quite damaged because you think he ultimately if you listen to his audio book or you get to sort of flesh out his backstory he's like quite a sad character isn't he yeah and i think he's he's always trying to fit in and um, but he's always just a, like a step behind or a step out of touch isn't he and, um that's, i think that's what's so like tragic about him as well it's that he's all almost there sometimes but he's yeah. never quite there and you know given if you look at his um his backstory the way he was brought up and like you right like sort of you know middle meets middle class, he always aspires to be like a bit upper middle class. He's never quite there. He yeah. always falls, doesn't he? I think that because he falls and that, that sort of still makes him quite um appealing for a lot of people. He's not just a cold, horrible person, is he? He's quite there are, in a way. There are sort of a, there are antecedents to this character as well. I think in some ways, um 
some a character is uh, as well known as Basil Forty from Forty Towers mm. is, is similar to the idea the idea of that. Like so, Forty Towers emerged in the seventies, and there was a whole generation of people at that point who were uh, who would, would have been too young to fight in the Second World War, but would too old to be part of the kind of counterculture of the 60s. Mm. So what happened was you've met, you had this generation that were middle-aged in the 70s who weren't able to kind of almost represent the country but had very, very traditional values. Mm. And they were sort of stuck in a Britain of the past, you know. Yeah. Um, and they were behind. They couldn't understand a sort of a new, you know, inclusive society or a new sort of almost sort of, you know, countercultural society. They were desperate for the values of pre-war but it had changed and they weren't actually part of it so they kind of had no yeah. excuse as it were for being you know xenophobic or you know set in their ways and stuff and I think Partridge is very similar to that the the difference as you said is that I think what Coogan has done in the past 10 years or so yeah. is made him a bit more likeable you know Partridge could be quite despicable in a lot of ways yeah. Uh, and so, and whilst there were always guests that you, or people he interacted with, you could see as more despicable. There was always something, you know, a, quite horrible about the way he, he behaved. But yeah. now, Coo, I think because of the overlap between Steve Coogan and Partridge, he's made him a lot more likable, and you see the struggle yeah. in him a lot more. Yeah, I think as well in, in like the early TV shows, you know, we see him struggle, but he's got that arrogance. But the way he yeah. speaks to like Sophie and. Um, like the way he treats Michael, like yeah. he's, um, I think you know, for for Partridge, Michael is like the perfect guy, and he's that guy who who will actually listen to him and be his friends, but he can also tell him what to do and control him. Yeah. Um, but you're right, since like mid morning matters from onwards, those characters he interacts with, it, it it's not about. I feel like the, the characters he's starting to interact with now are more cretinous than him, and you sort of, and maybe this is me getting older and basically turning <laughs> into like my more more like Partridge, but. The characters he interacts with now, you're right. I mean, I think we as an audience share Alan's point of view, and we see him as yeah, a bit more empathetic in that sense. But yeah. you're right. In in the first couple of seasons, he was just quite nasty and a bit cruel at times, wasn't he? Especially to Lynn. With Mid Morning Matters, actually, they've actually mm. made Lynn a bit nastier and s yeah. sort of brought out her ruthless side. Mm. Whether that's as a consequence of working for Alan, or whether actually that's what brought them together, mm. is that sort of slightly backstabbing competitive nature they have but yeah I think making her a bit more horrible means that you kind of let Alan off a bit because he in this is I'm yeah. Alan Partridge he, he kind of bullies her a lot doesn't yeah, he completely. You know? yeah. uh, or exploits her good nature and takes <laughs> advantage of her you know he's essentially there's a there's a whole bit about how low her wage is isn't it yeah, how yeah. he decides to give her a raise of time so far as this becomes so ubiquitous yeah. I sing that when I'm um, <laughs> that's my ring too no <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But when, when so our, 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 this yeah. is so deeply ingrained in our lives is that when I'm changing my son's nappy let's tell you what tell you what I'm yeah. going to change your book yeah. yeah. and it's one of these things you don't notice like I didn't even I don't think I noticed where the, the little melody was coming from you realise yeah. Partridge yeah everywhere so what are some of your um, you know, as a different entry points what are some what is what do you feel is like a quintessential Partridge for you I mean what yeah. is the best to recommend to listeners well, Definitely, I am Alan Partridge. Yeah, the TV yeah, show. Yeah, and the this time they me too yeah. dangerous. Yeah. What is it about the TV show you think that? Yeah. Um, like so much. I don't know. I think it. it like, I like I like the way it sort of takes this character from no one me, no one you, who was basically just you know like a pastiche, and it gives him a lot of like backstory and developments. I think that's where. If that hadn't been made, I don't think Partridge would have carried on in the way that he is, where he's he's quite a developed character with the you know, with the books and with yeah. other things to add to his backstory. So, mm -hmm. and it's just broadly speaking, as a as a comedy, it's got some of the most like quotable <laughs> moments in British sitcoms. It's, it's strange. I think it's yeah. interesting how so something that is does yeah. feel like it's got you know depth and layers yeah. to it. Is so quotable as well. That's yeah. always been a, a brilliance of it. I think is to, mm. and there you know it's you know okay. Not everyone's going to be recording their own podcast about this, but <laughs> it has got broad appeal. You know th yeah. there are th there are people who, and maybe that's the longevity of the character. But I don't know. I think there is there's something s there's often slapstick aspects of yeah. it. You know, and again, I think he's always suited to the audience of the time, isn't he? Because if you look, 
you know, the TV show. Um, one of the reasons me, my girlfriend finds it quite difficult, or did find it quite difficult to sort of get into Partridge, because those TV shows have got a laughter track, which we don't yeah. have anymore, do we? Yeah. And that can be quite off, off yeah. putting when, and then we go to like the radio show and the audio book and the podcast. It does sort of change to yeah. fit the medium, so. But, you know, being someone who's been there from, not the start, but I followed it for quite a long time. What I really find interesting about Alan is that he's got such an interesting life, but he just focuses on like the most mundane aspects of these extraordinary <laughs> events he's in. Yeah. And it's his inability to, to perceive that actually this ideal life that he's sort of imagined and he's striving for, it's actually, it's it's within his reach if he just sort of calmed down and was less conscious of who he was. And That's it. I think he's, I think he's got less. At, like imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. With where he's, because he, he knows that he wants to be famous and successful and he's got all these kind of demons from the past and you're right, he, he, but he's almost self-destructive, isn't he? You know yeah. that last episode of this time, <laughs> yeah. the interview once with Princess Anne. He blows it, and he knows that by the end. Mm. You know the the, um, the, uh, the 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 amazing things he has done, and people he's met, and the fact that he's killed yeah. two people, I think, or uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, albeit ac by accident, uh, he's killed two ways. people. Uh, maybe it's just yeah, one. Then it's no. one. It's the food isn't it? Food well, Michael, uh, I listened to the uh, listen to the rest of Nomad, oh, yeah. and um, what, what he talks about in Nomad is that Mike at the end of Nomad after the siege. So in, in sorry, at the end of yeah. Alpha Papa when they have the siege, Michael was seen jumping into the sea, mm. oh, right. and so so Alan refers to him as like in, in the past tense that he's committed suicide. But I think yeah. we haven't seen the end of Michael. Well, yeah. there's there's in I think it was either the week before or this week's episode mm. of this time. He it, to yeah, him, because he, he goes to a fella from Newcastle and starts oh, yeah. talking to him. It's, it was in the last episode, yeah, and then he sees the fella's got like the little tooth badge on. He says, Where did you get that? And the fella goes, Oh, my mate Michael gave me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So these incredible yeah. and strange things happen to him, obviously, to, for the sake of the series, but mm. in, the, in his autobiography, there's a huge chunk devoted to how he b makes the system at Nando's the most efficient he possibly can. It's the Nest, the Nando's efficiency system. Yeah, the Nando's efficiency system. And it's like he gets caught up on those little moments when he's, the whole of series two of I'm Alan Partridge, he's living in a static home yeah. because he's having this incredible house built with his sort of, yeah. his, you know, his earnings from the, the, the yeah. you know, the, the TV series he had and the fact that he was on BBC One. But you find out right at the end that that every feature of this house has been designed, but he's going to his bedroom will be the box room, <laughs> uh, and, and that, like that sort of idea that he can't cope with his own success yeah. in a way. It's it, like yeah, it's yeah. it's something he makes he makes himself uncomfortable. You know, yeah. that's it's, again it's tragic, isn't it? It's really sad. And, yeah. and, uh, but then at the other times you, you you know he deserves everything he gets, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, yeah. While while we're on the topic of say these two of I'm Alan Partridge. I think a lot of people think that's weaker, and I think I think some people criticise that of it because the Amanda Winnie himself said that the gap in between series one and two sitcoms had changed, and you had like The Office and that, and mm. series two like people say it feels a bit outdated, but. I would disagree. I just think it's better than the first series. Yeah, I think maybe yeah. the, the laughter track yeah. is probably because Matt was saying yeah. before the media, the medium had changed or the, the genre had changed mm. with the sitcom, and the, you know, whereas The Office owes so much to that, removing the laugh track from The Office yeah. was a big move, and it yeah. paid dividends. I think because the, the first series of My Man and Partridge is almost. They're both filmed in a sort of mockumentary style, even yeah. though there's no he doesn't ever address yeah. the camera directly, yeah. and it, because Alan's real, and he'd only ever been filmed where there would be cameras, mm. i.e. in a chat show or in a newsroom and stuff like that, yeah. kind of getting away with why would there be cameras following was always a kind of yeah. a conceit you had to break, yeah. you know, which the office got away with. So I guess they thought, well, well you can put a laughter track on this because why are yeah. people following him? But I think the first series was filmed because it was on a closed set, but outside the closed set, they had a st an audience in the studio. Oh, thinking, really? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So yeah. that, that could be actual audience laugh. Yeah. But the second series yeah. does have a laugh track. Yeah, it does, it? yeah. Yeah, it does, yeah. Which, I'd forgotten about it, because when I rewatched re it, and I was like, oh, it'll yeah, feel yeah. jarring it felt now. Yeah. 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 I think the same time, a similar series, a similar era, a League of Gentlemen, the mm -hmm. um, Rishi Smith and um, Steve Pemberton series mm -hmm. with Mark Gatiss. Uh, that's got a laugh track, and like if you go back to those, you wouldn't expect the yeah. League of Gentlemen to have a laugh track. But apparently, they, I think this is right. 
might be anachronistic. They considered not everyone. They thought that would be much more in keeping with the tone of the show. But actually, it was too freaky. It was too scary. Yeah. There was no <laughs> sense that it was a comedy at all. Yeah, I can imagine it. that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that was a really key period for the sitcom uh, to change over from yeah, definitely. traditional to modern, you know. Um, and do you know what, it's funny, for that reason, I think I've always kind of, you know, wrestled between the, knowing me, knowing you, and I'm Alan Partridge as to which was my favourite. But n- now, with the hindsight of the whole career, I Mid Morning Matters is my favourite of it all because yeah. it, it's a perfect combination of him acting up as the, the, the performer. But then also the, his real life coming through. Yeah. So you get the moments in between where he's playing a record and you, you kind of <laughs> see him. But also he, he lets that mask slip so frequently when he is on air, you yeah. know, in the way that he, the, the, the way he treats Simon um, yeah. and the way he treats his guests as well yeah. um, and, and talks to them and his own sense of height, you know, sense of self-importance. I think all of that comes through and it's, it's pure sitcom because he's trapped in that little booth <laughs> There's no getting out. I think the shot. There's about two camera positions yeah, in that yeah. whole webcam. series. Yeah, yeah. You know the yeah. webcam. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. And and so you, it's 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 brilliant. It's it's such a self-contained little comedy. <laughs> um, and the 15-minute episodes are, are great. So that for me, that's that's pure part. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's um, that's not my favourite, but I can I can see what you mean because it's it's it's, un, it's unfiltered. It's just yeah. No, it's yeah. I think I like that the set because I remember when it came out it was originally sponsored, produced by Foster's wasn't it? it was yeah, sponsored right. by it was, Foster's on yeah, YouTube web only wasn't it? Um, and, then and I really enjoyed it and then I remember you like from the first time you watched this saying this and then I went back again and watched it and I think it's one of those things I mean I loved it from the start but it's grown on me and like rose in like yeah. sort of that rank of the part of stuff ever since yeah, yeah. it's absolutely brilliant and psychic, psychic examines a big part of that isn't he because he allows that yeah. both sides of Partridge where he's you know maybe the sides where you feel sorry for him, but then he'll he'll say something really mean and cruel yeah. and reveal it all the side to him as well. So well, it's, yeah, so he like he stops you getting too close to him or like feeling too sorry for him. <laughs> so, it, it, traditionally, partially, although he's had the ability to take on people of higher status, like the guests he yeah. had on knowing me, knowing you, you know, that was that was where he got his come up and sorry, but he would try and take them on. I'm Alan Partridge is old because he's often he will be bullying people of sort of lower status characters, you know, people who work at the travel tavern yeah. or his, you know, his, <laughs> his, or Michael or his, you know, Lynn in particular, yeah. you know. But um, with um, with the, uh, the mid-morning matters, he's, he's, you know that he's employed Simon as a conduit to this other world that people keep talking about, the kind of the, the, the new tolerant, sort of world that he yeah. knows he struggles with that's why he likes psychic I mean, is that he he can help him understand this yeah. but at the same the same token simon's a bit smarter than him in these areas and he really makes alan feel um inferior and so he'll yeah. take that i'm the i'm the boss you're the the psychic and he'll beat him with that every now and then yeah, he resents his um a sense of humor doesn't he resents yeah. all those things that's yeah. it yeah um but like just the, the, that, and, and from their conversations though, you get the, the. I think the reason why people love it, or is because it t- little touches with reality and the sort of he, <laughs> he explains things that never needs explaining. So I think that they he describes their first meeting where they sat in a pub yeah. and he said, <laughs> and then Simon, uh, you know, ordered a pint and a bag of crisps, spliced the crisps <laughs> open <laughs> to make them shareable, and you can. Imagine that that's the first time Alan Partridge has ever seen yeah. seen anyone open a bag of crisps sideways to share, and it's changed. That has changed his world, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, that's something very there's something very sympathetic and endearing about that. Isn't yeah. it? He, his amazement. At, that but at the same time, he, 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 like it, it's big things, isn't it? That he has to maybe rethink about. Well, rethink about. But think about, or you know, when it, when his larger sort of ideology is a challenge, he yeah. just can't handle it, can he at all? No. I think that there's the the episode of that where the the hunter, the fellow who runs the, like the local hunt, comes on, and he's really like sucking up to him oh, yeah. first, and then he gets a call in. He's saying, "Oh yeah, you d- you didn't challenge him at all." So then he goes, "Oh yeah," and then after the break, he comes back and starts like going really hard on him. <laughs> and he has to give him the sign that after the race, it's too crazy. Yeah. 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 That's when he's like chasing, he's is, is like a cook report type. I don't know what series or where it's from. It might be, is it this time where he's chasing the guy down the streets, like doing the uh, the doorstep and trying to challenge the guy for his unfair business practices? Oh, at the end, it's on um, 
It's first... S- S- no, it's Sid's Isle. It's like, oh, like a mockumentary that he did. But all it yeah. takes for like to, to yeah. sort of derail Alan is that the guy who's like this scummy businessman offering horrible yeah. loans, all he says, yeah. oh, listen to him. Just show, yeah. And yeah. Alan all of a sudden <laughs> just totally changes because he found someone who showed him a little bit of respect. Yeah. So he's, yeah, yeah. it's like that vanity he just can't mm-hmm. get past. Yeah, yeah, very vain. He defers to authority almost instantly. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, you know, he'll drop people in it as well. Yeah. Um, but he does want to break free of certain shackles and conventions mm-hmm. and stuff. And that's what, yeah, make, that's where the conflict of the show comes from, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, himself you know his own his own psychology i think it's really enduring and i was saying to matt before this you know it'd be easy to just talk about a comedy character but one that's been on the screen for 27 years is you know that's that's tony soprano territory in terms of the amount yeah. of development that a character goes through and i think steve coogan has like navigated it brilliantly because he always you know steve coogan was very young when he created yeah. alan partridge there's an, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether the chronology or the, the it all work, continuity works out, but in the radio show of, Alan, I'm Alan Park, of Knowing Me, Knowing You, he says in one episode, I'm 37. And he, that Steve Coogan was probably mid-twenties at the time. And now yeah. I think Coogan's a similar age to what Alan probably is yeah. now um, yeah. meant to be. So there's a bit, of, but the, to not make that feel totally unbelievable, he's done brilliantly in yeah. maintaining it. Which rare, isn't it, as well, like a character like this where... You know, it, it depends on your age or how much you consume Partridge. Like he would, he has got a fully fleshed out life. Yeah. Like not just a career, and Partridge, let's say every five, six, seven years, like they they come up with a new project and comes back, don't they? But it, it is one like sort of continuous linear story, like a meta narrative almost, yeah. and that's that just on its own is like in the modern landscape yeah, is it's so impressive isn't it's it a cinematic universe before the yeah, cinematic yeah. Universe. Yeah, no, cinematic yeah. universe what's it's incredible i suppose maybe this has been part of it is he has had he we are meant to see him as part of that real world it's not like mm. a parallel yeah. world where there's an alan partridge yeah. another because he talks about actual celebrities he has yeah. encounters with they sometimes appear yeah, as themselves yeah. he's i think he's been in pretty much every um comic relief yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's been an uh, um um election night sort of satirical shows as well he's appeared in um, and so that, that means he is a real person in, in our but even at the premiere universe. of his film like yeah, it's yeah. not Coogan who turns up it's yeah. Partridge who yeah. turns up in yeah. Norwich <laughs> so I suppose that's a good opportunity to talk about um, the the I suppose um, the impact he's had on comedy characters as it mm. were because I you know Sasha Baron Cohen yeah. must to, must look to Partridge as a huge influence for yeah. his characters, you know, because he inhabits them, doesn't he? They, you know, Borat in particular mm-hmm. and Ali G. He would have been around the same time, wouldn't he? Make a few because yeah. because yeah. I remember Ali G. Is there used to be a TV show, yeah. the Eleven O'clock Show. Yeah. And on that, we had Ricky Gervais as the angry reporter and Ali G, and they were the first incarnations of those two characters. Well, like you know, the Ricky Gervais's big break. Yeah. So that was all coming up at the same time. So. That was about 99, so it was yeah. about a year after the first series of I'm Alan Partridge. So would you say they're all riding the same wave, or that's like on the back of... Because I, I, I haven't got any understanding about how popular Partridge was at the time when it came out. I would say, I think those things came within a year or two after the first series of I'm Alan Partridge. Yeah. So I think that... Uh, and and uh, Coogan had kept the character alive from Know Me, mm. Knowing You in '94. Uh, you know he'd still been on sort of specials and things yeah. like that. So I'd say that they looked to how you can keep a yeah. comedy character going over a sort of narrative, and taken that on board. And and of course, yeah, I know that Ali G started as a sort of spoof. It yeah. was like a almost like a gotcha moment, was a yeah, candid yeah. camera type, um, fake interviews and so yeah. on. So, but I'd, I'd say that there, he, you know, a lot of people would take say, claim that he was an influence, or mm. Partridge was an influence. It's all their own creation of mm-hmm. comedy characters. What's his face? Yeah. Chris Morris's fault. Yeah. Oh, this, like, can't take this <laughs> brand of comedy. His brand of comedy, yeah. And it's, it's interesting because he sort of moved out of TV now and into movies. Yeah. And Armand Dionucci obviously stayed with satire, but got a lot more political with the, yeah, the thick of it and mm-hmm. Veep. Um, it's now sort of doing more to do with movies as well yeah. but uh, they're all an incredibly talented bunch of people yeah. aren't they you know. as, as they talk about the people behind these it's interesting isn't it that Steve Coogan in, in late, later years especially has become quite vocal and bit of a um, like the face of you know like the Leveson Inquiry and, off, 
yeah. Yeah, hacked off. So it's yeah. interesting because like we've got Steve Coogan as a reference in real life and he's talking about all these issues on one side and then Partridge is the yeah. exact opposite. I mean, if they exist in the same world, they'd be... Any, yeah. Oh, I feel Coogan would perceive, they see, perceive each other as enemies. I'd, I'd like to see that. That'd be interesting. Know, yeah, they, yeah, God, imagine that. Each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it is interesting that because Coogan was, became a bit of a sort of playboy of the 90s yeah, comedy yeah. scene because he was younger and he was kind of this young, good looking guy as well yeah. in, the, in the 90s that he managed to sort of court. He was sort of riding a wave of Cool Britannia and the arrival of Labour. Yeah. And, you know, he's a sort of. Uh, originally from Manchester, isn't he? And uh, yeah. sort of had, you know, these sort of uh, quite. I think he came from that kind of quite strong left wing background. It's interesting the hacked off. I always find it interesting with mm. him because he, because baby, basically the papers exploited his personal life. Yeah. Um, and he, his phone was hacked, and he, you know he was tabloid fodder for a lot of time. But now that he fights for a kind of uh, increased privacy laws and more yeah. substantial controls over the. You know, I mean, he would, he rails against the Tory party, but, uh, you know, he, he wants a, a, a more controlled press, yeah. which is somewhat odd, odd with, uh, you know, yeah, he's, he's partridge I think. Yeah. That may be some of his views. And, and Coogan's always been kind of a, a real, I mean, I, I suppose he'd probably be, hate to be described as a champagne socialist, but he yeah. loves his fast cars. You know, he he's someone who would have done the old fastest lap on Top Gear and oh, stuff yeah. like that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. He has been on top. Yeah, it? I yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. cars are his thing, and yeah. and he's, he's been done for speed in a few yeah. times. Yeah, well. mm. and there's you know Partridge's <laughs> yeah. interest in that sort of materialistic side. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know it, there are, there are crossovers between the character yeah. and Coogan as well. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I think there was, a, there was an interview, and Steve Coogan said uh, Partridge gives him an outlet to do a lot of the things <laughs> that he might not want to be seen doing. Yeah, so I want to actually, yeah. Is Partridge yeah. actually it were all destined to yeah, become yeah. like a <laughs> yeah. version of that eventually? You know, as you get older, you apparently become more conservative or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we're all sort of going towards that. That's it, and uh, that's the other thing that Partridge is a sort of a good conduit for as well. Is that despair at modern life? As much as yeah. he, <laughs> as much as he kind of doesn't like, you know, that or is struggles to keep up with the changes. He does. He is able to vocalise that, yeah. and it was the oh, that, this country. Yeah. You know that <laughs> that sort of refrain from uh, I'm Alan Partridge series on this country, and uh, everyone feels like that at some point, don't they? Whoever it's with, and uh, yeah. yeah, he 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 gets that. And even though he's yeah wants to be part of that establishment and part of that mainstream and things like yeah. that, and he's he, he's equally as good at taking the Mickey out of. You know, the the sort of banality of mainstream sort of ness, if you like, yeah. but also people's pretentiousness as well. We can cut people, yeah. cut people down. So it's a, it is a great character for that. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's summed up the uh, when he's asked, he's he's trying so hard to impress the young lad who works at the travel tavern. <laughs> he st- he lives in for 186 days. He doesn't, you know. This this lad doesn't care at all about his job, and Alan finds that so frustrating. <laughs> but he also admires him because Alan would love not to care about yeah. things. And eventually, they get talking about music, um, because Alan's got a, a you know a hugely expensive Bang and Olufsen sound system, and this suddenly gains the young lad's respect, which that's all Alan wants, isn't it? Compliments and respect. Yeah. So they start talking about music, and he asks him what his favourite. A Beatles album is, <laughs> yeah. and, and the, again, the incredibly famous line where he says it, it has to be the best of the Beatles, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it, it simultaneously completely sort of mocks the, the the fact that we do live in a society where some people would think the best e- Beatles album was the best of the Beatles. Yeah. And how awful <laughs> it is to say that, but it also mocks the pretentiousness of the fact you're laughing at someone for not knowing the name of a, yeah, your own yeah. favourite Beatles oh. album. It's, like you, you're laughing at other people and yourself. Yeah. Whenever you hit that joke, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> but I love it. I love his ability. That if he if he gets like the the smallest hint or a little sniff, that he, he he'll accidentally sort of walk into a situation where he might someone might actually respect him or actually listen to him. <laughs> so I was watching Scissor Dial the other day, and he's he's with like a gang of um you know young kids, yobbos or something he calls yeah. them. Um, and he, he realises that he feels very intimidated he's not quite sure how to sort of ingratiate himself and he realises they're into cars yeah. and then it just cuts like a straight cut to him doing like a handbrake turn yes. he goes do you like that do you like that and he says well let's do in the car park a wet car park in um, Thamesby or whatever so any moment and that's where I think he would sell out to anyone wouldn't he? and he would just sort of do and say whatever he needs to do to get that sort of um, confirmation off other people mm-hmm. so it's just a 
Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> enduring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, there's been points where I worried they wouldn't know what to do next. And so, yeah. funny you mentioned Alpha Papa. I was always against the idea of a, of a partridge mm. movie. Yeah. I, there's a history in British sitcom, oh, yeah. in British comedy, that the film version is just you you take them on holiday. That's such yeah. a cliche. Yeah. Holiday yeah. on the buses. That's yeah. Holiday yeah. on the yeah. buses. There was a, a special of. The, um, there's the in between or something. The in between. Yeah. The, the, the there was a two hour special of Only Fools and Horses called yeah. Miami yeah. Twice, yeah. which was awful. <laughs> And yeah, so just talking with the, yeah. the gangster who looks yeah. exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Jason, Jason, Jason Place, plays, but yeah, both. Yeah. The gangster as well. Yeah. So, the, and I thought, is it going to be that? But actually, I mean, it mm. is a bizarre setup. It's a siege sort of yeah. Yeah. Um, scenario. Yeah. But it, it, I, we saw it a fact, and it was it is funny. It's yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the only examples off the top of my yeah. head where they've trans translated the medium of TV into film, and it's yeah. worked. And it did feel like Partridge. Didn't mm. it? Yeah. It did. Maybe that's like the first joke is the. It, the the TV show always starts like it fades into the radio show, like the banal questions are asking, yeah. and that really I think hooked me in straight away. Whereas yeah. the first question is about which is the worst manga, <laughs> the best yeah, manga. Yeah, yeah. Pretty clear that one. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I think it's one like there's only I think two other films that translate well. One of them, the film of Potter, I think translates well, and another one, um, in the loop. So yeah. Armando and Uchi is clearly. Yeah, knows the formula for translating. That's right. Yeah, TV yeah. to film. And actually, Just, I think yeah. it was Ianucci's involvement yeah. that probably reassured me that uh, yeah. he was. And I, yeah, and I, I think that's I, we on our previous uh, incarnations of this podcast when we've talked about comedy before. Armando Ianucci's always come up as yeah. you know as a, a he's been so important over the past. 30 years for British comedy in terms of yeah. producing. He's remained behind the scenes for so many different shows, just producer mm. and producer yeah. and writer. And, uh, you know, he's, he's somebody who will be on, he's had his own uh, sketch shows and stuff, so he has been on screen, but he's such a sort of, you know, brilliant, confident, yeah. uh, mm. uh, finger on the pulse writer with a zero ego from what I can tell, you know. Yeah, definitely, because it, it, it probably surprised how few people, not few people, but he's not really, I wouldn't say he's necessarily a household name across the country, but no. he's been involved in so many mm. yeah. like iconic shows and films and that. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, once so once his sort of involvement ended, it, the sort of mantle was sort of handed over to these guys called the Gibbons, Gibbons Brothers. Gibbons Brothers. Yeah. 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 Well, wasn't that an unsolicited script that they sent into um, Baby Cow Productions, which then became uh, Mid Modern Matters, I think. Oh, yeah. right, okay. Because they know, I mean, yeah. that we you know a fanboy about him all the time, but the, their knowledge of him mm. must be incredible. And they, yeah. they wrote, the, did they write the autobiography? Yeah, they wrote. Yeah. They've written, I think, everything since Mid Modern Matters. They've sort of taken over the yeah. creative uh, control over it. Yeah. Or the creative direction. And it's interesting, is it like, that you, they must know everything about the character, but I think we could we all probably sit here and think, oh, I could write a Partridge script easily because yeah. we know it so well, but we'd fall into that trap of it would be too cliches and mm. it'd end up not, it'd be like a parody of Partridge. Yeah. The fact that they've just got it, the character, haven't they? They've really evolved it. They haven't just repeated the same thing. It has evolved as a character, like a real person. Mm. It's remarkable, actually, the Partridge character. Yeah, definitely, without it sort of changing too sharply in one direction. I think Steve Coogan keeps check on that, but mm. like I said I think there is that overlap might be a very a tricky thing to, to yeah. deal with. Mm. Well, well, you mentioned Baby Cow Productions. That's, I think, also part of the legacy of this character mm. as well, because I think on the back of Partridge's success, Steve Coogan was able to start Baby Cow Productions. At that point, I think their producer for... His stuff was a guy called Henry Normal, mm -hmm. and um, one of the first shows that they produced without Coogan in it was something called Marion and Jeff. Have you ever seen that? No. This was basically brought um, uh, what's his name, Rob Brydon, yeah. to the country's uh -huh. attention. Yeah. They were short, 10, 15 minute episodes, which was just Rob Brydon playing the character called Keith Barrow, who's a taxi driver, sat in his car. So it was a single shot, uh, single take, I think. But sing, certainly, single shot um, of, yeah. from the inside of a car. What, like the Peter K one? Like mm. car shit? But like he's that. parked up. Ah, I mean, yeah. It's like he's put his phone on the dashboard yeah. ah, and it's like yeah. keeping and his own little diary. He's keeping a video diary talking about his ex wife Marion and her new living yeah. lover, Jeff, mm. and talking about the divorce that they're going through, how difficult it is, but also he refers to his kids as his little smashers, and you realise that this character 
is completely being taken advantage of by mm. his wife and completely mocked by this new lover, Jeff, because he thinks Jeff's a cracking bloke. Yeah. He's, he's going to be a great, you know, stepdad to his kids and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's a it's a real tragedy comedy type. Yeah, thing. it's tragic. Uh, brilliant acting from Rob Brydon yeah. and also really really funny. And that that was Baby Cow Productions. And I think on on the back of that we got Gavin and Stacey because I think yeah. that was no, Baby right. Cow. That was I it, think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that there's. Uh, I think that was Baby Cow anyway. But the, the, that, that you know, Partridge's success has got a legacy in other. Yeah. Pockets of comedy. That's what's strange actually because that way you just described with Jeff then and mirrors Partridge's relationship with his wife, doesn't he? But yeah. you've never really seen that in any of his shows, have we? Or is it's always like referred back to anecdotally or it's covered in his uh, book with the idea of Alan's wife is going out with him um, or like sleeping over at the gym and Alan thinks that's normal until <laughs> yeah, you know, that's right. exposed. It, the cracks in his marriage are talked about in both series of Know Me, the radio and the TV of Know Me, yeah. Knowing You, and then he speaks. We know they're going through the, the, the separation and divorce because she's living with a narcissistic sports pimp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, but a lot, a, lot of, a lot of that's fleshed out in the uh, the book, his, right. his biography, which obviously if he wrote it, yeah. uh, his wife doesn't, it's, yeah, she makes her sound like a evil, evil woman. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he evil woman. Yeah, it's exactly. yeah, destroying her reputations, yeah, yeah. isn't it? But did you know um, as well, I just found this out the other day, that um, Steve Coogan's uh, assistant is called Lindsay. Right. So there's the sum. <laughs> Wow. How she feels about Lynn. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think Lynn likes him? Yeah. Lynn likes Alan. Yeah. I don't think it's not about. I don't think yeah. it's about like. I think. Yeah. Um, she's so old-fashioned in her views that uh. the fact that an, a successful man has given her a job and seen value in her, she probably, mm. she probably hates him, but would still like take a bullet for him. Yeah. Well, I like, think. I think also, like you said, she's so old-fashioned. I think she respects the fact that he yeah. likes these old-fashioned values. I think yeah. she would quite like him to bring back. Yeah, like she, she wants. He reminds her of a time when TV presenters were like that, and yeah. it was. And she wants that back on her screen. She's as fed up with, you know, woke, uh, oh, yeah. lefty TV shows. She would quite like it to be old-fashioned comedy, you know, because Partridge is very sexist. I mean, he, yeah. he he doesn't know how to treat women. He doesn't. He's intimidated by powerful. That's yeah. you talked about lines in the household. There's a, an early episode of No Me No You where there's a band on, and the drummer's woman he goes, oh. Notice the female drummer there. Close your eyes. Could be a man. And, uh, <laughs> so whenever we, so whenever uh, <laughs> at home it's mentioned that uh, uh, there's a, a woman in a role that is stereotypically or traditionally inhabited by a man, mm. the phrase "close your eyes" could be a man. Yeah. Close your eyes could be a man is always, <laughs> always said. So, but yeah, I think Lynn quite, you know, quite enjoys the fact that he's a bit yeah. sexist. Well, even if you look at the even the last episodes of this time when um, Alan is talking about. Uh, he, he always used the full title, doesn't he, for the princess Anne? Yeah. And the way he's like sort of um, having a go at everyone and t- telling them the proper etiquette. The way Lynn is looking at him, it's like a, ch- a mother looking at a child, yeah. like yeah. so with pride uh, that he's bringing this back. Yeah, so. yeah she's very. But again, she's like Lynn as well. She's someone who gets maybe goes under the radar a little bit. Mm. Um, just, it is great. It's, the perform- the performance is incredible. Yeah. Lynn, Lynn Benfield's the character. Yeah. Felicity Montague. Yeah. The actress. She's brilliant, isn't she? Yeah. She lives in that character so much. And it's interesting, isn't it? Like how she seems to be, she seems to be willing to do anything. Felicity Montague will do anything for Coogan. Like Lynn will do anything for Partridge. Because like you think coming back to do this time, it's like well, we'll only see the back of your head for maybe 30, 40 seconds an episode, and your lines will be muffled. But she still comes back to do it. Yeah. So yeah. it's great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so before we start wrapping up, then um, are there any like? Fate, were like some stand up moments, some like his career favourite moments, or like favourite characteristics of him that you've got? Because I say for me, it's I've already mentioned his, his ability to focus in on the mundane and in the extraordinary. Um, and it's, it's, he, he talks the way he talks and he understands reality in the world is through references to old media, but again, it's very like, classical and sort of just out of touch, isn't it? His references. Um, so that's what I love about him, really. Um, I just I think the way he represents his, his values and how they clash with the modern yeah. values. It's that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, like his, like there's an innocence to him as well. Yeah, there's yeah. so many moments mm-hmm. where he gets sort of um, exposed, like when he's t- you know he's doing the video about um, the wet t-shirt competition <laughs> and he doesn't understand water sport and there's loads of little bits and bobs yeah. like that where you can you can yeah he just feels. Yeah. You're, I really feel for him in those moments, yeah. but 
at the same time he's he's quite pathetic and exposes yeah, no, that, doesn't he? I think it's like it's interesting though because like some of the things he does, it's disp- like sometimes he's he's like actively racist because there's the bit where um, he's interviewing a black fella on him. Um, what's it called? Is it this time? No, uh, mid morning matters. Yeah, that one. Yeah, and. He th- he's lost his phone and he, he's saying to the like he thinks the fella's nicked his phone yeah. and then um, like but and it's like that's quite horrible to think that but it's like you, you feel a bit sorry for him because he's just squirming to get out of it and um, and then it turns out at the end of the episode he comes in and he did they just switched the phone he had the wrong phone back yeah, yeah he's getting yeah. caught out yeah, by, yeah. again yeah. caught out by himself and that's yeah. that's yeah. the the is that for me, that's the yeah. thing. He catches himself at his, his own downfall, yeah. which makes it difficult to watch. Yeah. And but sometimes he's so childish. So in another mm. episode of this Morning Matters, where they got the guy on doing a sort of sponsored side yeah. <laughs> type thing, okay. and they're talking about how you know he's got this club of young kids who, uh, who are training to better their lives mm. or whatever it is, or to get you know it's like a sort of social project. I think he said, you know, d- don't get me wrong, Alan. Some of these kids, you know, they can cycle ten miles in thirty minutes. <laughs> and just out of a weird desperation to be better, Alan says, well, I can cycle 30 miles in 10 minutes. <laughs> and the guy sort of sits there and goes, well, that would be 180 miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he said, well, the first one then. And it's sort of like his desperation to be better than someone else mm. always catches him out. And that's tragic. And that's yeah. that's why I think, like I said, we, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't care about going too deep on this because it's, essentially it's my job. <laughs> but... Uh, is I for me it's become a study of the human condition and how we're all yeah. we're all yeah. rubbish at this sort of thing. We all trip ourselves over and we all we're, we're all our own worst enemies. In that yeah, way. Exactly. That's, that's a great. Uh, if you can do that sort of study through comedy, then that's genius for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I think yeah, it's, it's fair to say that we can all probably think back in our lives and realise we've had the partridge moment. Mm. Oh, good. Yeah. Too many. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. It'd be yeah. fascinating to like, as a teacher, it'd probably fascinating for you to teach part of the media class the, and it's, but it's yeah. one of the reasons why it's so difficult because yeah. it, it, well first of all I mean it'd be interesting from a character point of view to study in like a literature class almost but yeah but there's so many different references now as mm. well I mean that's the tricky thing that there are and uh, you know it's it's difficult teaching anything that this there's heaped in so much mm. history of, mm. of stuff but uh, but yeah no from that from that human condition point of view yeah. definitely I think it is you know, yeah, I think like, that's a testament to the writers across his entire career, hasn't he? Because he's yeah. never, you're right, he's never, there's always like a depth and complexity to the character. He's never just the comedy sports writer or the comedy mm. radio presenter. Yes, that's you really it. feel everything he's going through. Yeah. When, and like, uh, even if like he's doing stupid stuff, like when he's, he's bamboozled by Chris Morris playing the farmer. Right, yeah. And you know, <laughs> Chris Morris, the farmer's completely correct, but you still, you understand why yeah. Alan will not give her up and you sort of, you understand why he goes to these depths because he's, you know, we just yeah, it's just absolutely. The right. in the knowing me, knowing you, one of the episodes he addresses bad reviews that the show has had, yeah. and <laughs> he calls out the reviewer and and quotes him back to him, and then gets the audience to disagree. Uh, a year after that happened, I think it was mm. the TV presenter Noel Edmonds on an episode yeah. of Noel Edmonds House Party <laughs> yeah, yeah. did exactly the same thing, and, yeah. and really, and it's like well, when you see a real person doing that, you realise that that's something. There's something wrong with that sort of psychologically or there's a sort of ego issue yeah. here and it's a really strange moment of TV Alan had already done it and see that's when you realise Alan Partridge is a sort of study of it's not just like you said yeah. not just a copy of mm. are these other yeah. characters it really gets into the psyche of them you know maybe yeah maybe he, he allows us to understand like these people a little bit more because you're right so there's so many people who probably think of people like Noel Edmonds as like the, the personality they present yeah like just this sort of wacky nice guy and all that type of stuff but actually through seeing Partridge and seeing him preempt moments like that, yeah. they, uh, people expose themselves, don't they? Yeah, totally. And we were talking actually before before we started recording about um, in Nomad, his latest yeah. novel, there is an obsession and a fixation with Noel Edmonds. Right. <laughs> he says, uh, "I've got nothing against the man himself. I just hate the way he thinks, speaks, acts, and talks." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the um, the acknowledgments, there's no one I wish to acknowledge. Okay. Condemnments. Yeah. As all those people there, yeah. ISIS, Edmonds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, 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 a good yeah, thing. Yeah. I have small mind with yeah, you, yeah, you'll never yeah, let a grudge yeah, go, yeah, ever. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, ever, yeah, ever, yeah, ever. Yeah. Very petty. Yeah. Needless mm-hmm. to say, I had the last laugh. 
Well, I think that's a great place to wrap it up, actually. It is. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Connor, for coming in. So, yeah. um, and hopefully we'll be back soon with the third episode of our podcast. Um, but before we finish, um, any final thoughts? Anything you want? To, any recommendations for... Maybe if there's anyone out there who's, who's never seen Partridge, where you, would you recommend starting somewhere or going from the very beginning? Um, I'd say... I don't know. It depends on what you like. I'd say if you... If you're into your, your sitcoms, watch uh, I Am Alan Partridge. If not really, just watch this time. Yeah, yeah. this time yeah. I suppose as a relevant, yeah, it's, it's an incredibly yeah. relevant um, parody of magazine shows yeah. in yeah. the two thousand, mm. what the twenty first century, isn't it? That's that, they get that right, you know. And we, I, I know, we could talk for ages about this, mm. but the men, special mention to the actress who plays Jenny Gresham for mm. absolutely yeah. nailing yeah. Yeah. that She's character. Crazy. Um, I wouldn't know where to start to recommend Partridge. He's been too much, but I will say for those people who like Partridge, who are kind of getting more and more into the accidental Partridge Twitter feed mm. is one of the funniest. <laughs> things. Well, it's actually strange you mentioned that because it was taken offline last week. Oh right. Well, um, the person who runs the account has started selling merchandise, and they've had a few cease and desist. So they put a, a tweet out like I think last week or two weeks ago saying um. this the and the accounts, but there are a few others. So you got political partridge, yeah. and there may be other accidental partridge have popped up, but the right. original APs. I think the accounts are still there, but they're yeah. no longer posting. And this is on YouTube, is it? So I suppose mm. we can get anyone to comment with their own accidental partridges. My yeah. my mum would take me, not that she'd ever find out, but a, a few years ago, um, we were at, I was staying with parents for Christmas, and on Boxing Day, mm. she took a phone call. Right, she, you know, mum had prepared this lovely dinner, and she got a phone call just as she was putting the dinner out and everyone sat around she took the phone call and it was just like a sales call but all we could hear as she left room was she said um well i'm sorry but you're actually interrupting a festive meal and, <laughs> <laughs> and that was it like the, the yeah. room erupted it was like yeah, yeah. you know when she came back she said well, what are you all laughing it's like this accidental partridge moment that you did it was yeah. ridiculous so everyone does it and it is it is part of that yeah that's probably made me check myself more than once like, especially <laughs> doing this job like speaking in front of a group of people because, you know, I've told the class, there's a couple of teachers yeah. I remember through, like, you know, on the first day of high school, my teacher walked backwards and slipped into the bin. So it doesn't matter what he taught me for the next seven years. He's the guy who <laughs> fell in the bin. Yeah, so, yeah, he's probably helped me more than one occasion. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's it. So yeah. this has been uh, great. Um, so thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, and we're all off to get a mushroom slice in a BP garage. Bye-bye. Oh, a cup of beans. Yeah.